Open the pod bay doors, Tom. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could while away. 46, 56 degrees. Thank you, Beth. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Just a couple of anecdotes. Well, first of all, I was uh, born on a farm, so you may pretty much ignore all the titles that were mentioned and regard me as a farm boy. But um, a couple of days ago, um, I had uh, the producer of arrival at uh, the front porch of my home, so that was a nice uh, occasion. Um, and um, on Friday night, um, I was asked to speak uh, to the Harvard Alumni Association and I told them that uh, the best way to promote uh, diversity and inclusion is to uh, enhance the vocabulary of scientists to discuss extraterrestrials, because those that come from very far away probably have very different cultures than we have. And so um, what I would focus on today, uh, you can see in the middle of this slide, it's uh, my book, Extraterrestrial. Um, and if I had to summarize it in one sentence, I would say, when you're not ready to find exceptional things, you would never discover them. And what you see on the right side is a textbook that uh, was published by Harvard University Press, um, more than a thousand pages long, and it lays out the uh, scientific background to the search for life, both primitive microbial life and the advanced technological life. What you see on the left side is um, a picture of a photograph uh, that was hung on the walls of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Arts and Humanities uh, in October 2020, just a year ago. It was taken by Herlinde Quilbel, who came to my office and asked me to write on the palm of my hand the question that I regard as most important in science. And I wrote, are we alone? A month ago, I received an email from a rabbi in a congregation in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He said that he decided to give a sermon about my book for the High Holidays, the Jewish High Holidays. And I was quite shocked because uh, it implied that my book has some religious implications. I didn't realize that. <laughs> and then a colleague of mine said, the next time we meet, for dinner, my wife and I would like you to give a sermon. To which I replied, I would never lead a congregation whose members agree with me. <laughs> and also a month ago, uh, the US Congress called for a permanent uh, office that will address unidentified aerial phenomena. Apparently there are objects in the sky that uh, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence is unable to recognize. I mean, they're not doing their job and they admit it in front of the Congress. So the Congress decided to establish an office that would look into that. That's interesting. Now, the one thing I learned from uh, practicing astronomy for several decades is a sense of modesty. I call it cosmic modesty. Um, and the reason is simple. Uh, about half of the sun-like stars in the universe have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation. And what that means is that not only we are not at the center of the universe, as uh, people thought uh, thousands of years ago, our backyard is not unusual. We are not privileged in any way. And when you look at a painting uh, of an emperor, like the one shown here, being very proud of himself after conquering a small piece of land here on Earth, that's not very impressive because there are more habitable Earths in the observable volume of the universe than there are grains of sand on all beaches on Earth. So this alpha male is no different than an ant that hugs a single grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. That's not very impressive. 
But I can understand where it's coming from because when I looked at my daughters when they were young and stayed at home, they thought that they are at the center of the universe, that they are very privileged, that they are the smartest in the world. And that changed when we took them to the kindergarten. They met other kids, some of which are smarter than they are. And so our civilization will mature when we meet others, when we have encounters of the third kind. Now, we know that most stars formed before the sun, billions of years before the sun. We can map the star formation history of the universe. And since many of these stars host planets like the Earth, you can imagine a civilization like ours that predated us, maybe by a billion years. That's not speculative. That's just saying we are not privileged. That's all. And we are currently developing artificial intelligence systems that drive cars. And perhaps within a decade will outsmart us. So just imagine sending those AI systems to space. They will be our technological kids. We could educate them when they are young through machine learning and then let them explore the world. They would be AI astronauts. There is no need to send humans to space because Darwinian evolution selected us to live here on Earth. But AI astronauts may survive for a long time and they, don't, they could be self-sustained. They, they could be autonomous without waiting for guidance from us. And if we can imagine such a future, then maybe a civilization that predated us by a billion years already realized it. And that would mean that the Milky Way galaxy is full of such probes. Now, this is not a philosophical issue. The only way to find out is by looking through telescopes. And we should not repeat the mistake made by philosophers four centuries ago when they told Galileo Galilei that they know that the sun moves around the earth. I mean, if you look at the sky, the sun seems to move. They said, we know that and we don't want to look through your telescope. And they put him in house arrest. Today, they would have canceled him on social media. But we don't want to make that mistake. We want to look for the answers through our telescopes. And we did. The first object from outside the solar system was spotted in 2017 by a telescope in Hawaii. It was given the name Oumuamua, which means a scout, a messenger from afar, arriving first. And it didn't look like a comet or an asteroid, the type of rocks that we have seen before within the solar system. It had a lot of strange properties. First, we didn't expect to see a rock based on what we know in the solar system. Second, it originated from a small, from a very special frame of reference where it had a very small speed relative to the so-called local standard of rest, which is the frame that you get to when you average over the motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the, of the sun. And only one in 500 stars is so much at rest as Oumuamua was. Its brightness changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling, implying a very extreme shape. And the best fit to the variation of light was that of a pancake-like object, a disk shape. And then there, were, there was no gas seen around it, so it was clear that it's not a comet, it didn't evaporate. No water vapor or carbon-based molecules or dust. But nevertheless, there was a force acting on it. And it couldn't be the rocket effect from the evaporation. So the only explanation I could think of was it's the reflection of sunlight. But for that to be effective, the object had to be very thin sort of like a sail pushed by light. Now, 
Other astronomers were not happy with that interpretation because nature doesn't make thin objects. It implies that perhaps the object is artificial, which I suggested as a possibility. But they tried to explain the properties of the objects. And, and, and the only way for them to explain it was that it's something we have never seen before. It's either a dust bunny, a collection of dust particles very loosely bound that are pushed by reflecting light because it's, they are sort of as light as a feather, so to speak. And the problem with that is that such an object would not maintain its integrity when it gets close to the sun. There was a suggestion maybe it's an iceberg made of pure hydrogen, so we can't see the hydrogen when it evaporates. And the problem with that is that it wouldn't survive the journey through interstellar space. And then there was a suggestion, maybe it's a nitrogen iceberg chipped off the surface of a planet like Pluto. And the problem is there is not enough nitrogen <laughs> available. So the way I think of it is that maybe most of the time we see natural objects, rocks, just like we find on the beach. But as we walk on the beach, every now and then, we see a plastic bottle. And Oumuamua may have been a plastic bottle, indicating that there is a civilization out there. Because it didn't look like anything we have seen before. And there was another object discovered just a year ago. It was given the name 2020 SO, discovered by the same telescope and shared the same qualities as Oumuamua. It exhibited an excess push away from the sun by reflecting sunlight without a cometary tail. And then the astronomers realized, actually, it came from Earth. It's a rocket booster that we launched in 1966. And we know that it was thin and therefore had a large area for its mass. So it could have been pushed by reflecting sunlight. So we know it's artificial because we produced it. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? And just imagine a caveman finding a cell phone. The caveman who is used to playing with rocks all of his life would say, it's just a rock of a different type that we've never seen before. Just like Oumuamua is a hydrogen iceberg that we've never seen before, or a nitrogen iceberg that we've never seen before. And if the caveman would throw away the cell phone, then of course that will be the end of it. So if we don't look through telescopes, we might conclude it's a natural object. But it could also be the beginning of a learning experience because the caveman may press a button and record his voice, and then press another button and record his image. And then it will be clear that the cell phone is not a rock. So we need to press the buttons on objects like Oumuamua. And a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book. I wouldn't need to write the book if we had an image. Again, it's not a philosophical question. <laughs> we just need a high-resolution image. Even though I love philosophy, I mean, I, I'm just saying this is not a philosophical question. And here is an image that we obtained with the OSIRIS-REx mission when it landed on the asteroid Bennu. And we can tell that it's a rock. And it will bring a sample of this rock to Earth in 2023. So to figure out if Oumuamua or these unidentified aerial phenomena are encounters of the third kind, I decided to establish the Galileo project. There were a few uh, multi-billionaires that visited the porch of my home in July. They allocated $2 million to my research account at Harvard. And I said, OK, I don't need anyone else. I can go ahead and do it. So we established the Galileo project uh, because 
extraordinary conservatism leads to extraordinary ignorance. And we dare to look through new telescopes for the answer. Just to give an example, if you have a lens of one meter diameter, you can resolve an object the size of a person at a distance of a mile with a megapixel image, a million pixels. So that means you can see the head of a pin on that object. You can tell the difference between a label saying made in Russia or made in China and a label saying made on exoplanet X. And we want to get such telescopes in the optical visible band, in the infrared, in the radio, put them together. And in fact, we just started to order instruments. And then, separate from that, searching for the nature of unidentified aerial phenomena using these telescopes, we will also try to search for objects like Oumuamua. It's a fishing expedition. We don't know what we will find. If we find only sardines, these are objects that have mundane explanations, so be it. But it's the first scientific project aimed at checking if there is any equipment near Earth that was sent by extraterrestrial civilizations. The first time. And as you all know, on June 25th, there was a report delivered to Congress about these unidentified aerial phenomena. And that convinced me that we need to establish a project of this nature, the Galileo project. So we have by now uh, more than 30 exceptional scientists in the research team. You can see them here. Uh, we have a scientific advisory board. We have a philanthropic board, public outreach, and a lot of research affiliates. I received thousands of emails from people interested in contributing from their expertise. We have $2 million, but to really accomplish the task, we need 20. Uh, so I hope that in the coming months we'll get there. And just to remind you, about 70 years ago, a famous physicist named Enrico Fermi went to lunch in Los Alamos, and they were chatting about extraterrestrials. And he said, well, if they are out there, where is everybody? Now, this is very pretentious because, you know, we have recorded history of only 10,000 years. That's one millionth of the age of the Earth. And why would they come and visit us right now when we are asking this question? It's just like sitting on the couch at home and saying, nobody is knocking on my door, therefore I have no neighbors. Um, and also it's possible that the window of opportunity is short. You know, we are destroying our environment. Maybe we will not survive for more than a few centuries from now unless we correct ourselves. And so if there is a short window of opportunity for us to communicate, then looking for radio signals is not the right approach. But looking for relics, equipment that they sent out, is the right approach. It's just like archaeology. And my hope is that it will inspire us to behave better. Because if you look at human history, um, what you see coming back again and again are groups of people trying to feel superior relative to other people. The best example is the Second World War, where Nazi Germany um, triggered the death of 75 million people. That was 3% of the world population in 1940. Just think about it, it's 20 times more deaths than those triggered by COVID-19 so far. 20 times more because a group of people decided to feel superior. Now, if we find an advanced civilization out there that is much more intelligent than we are, or sophisticated than we are, then all of our small genetic differences will become meaningless. And perhaps that will inspire us to treat each other with respect as equal members of the human species. Thank you.